Hey, I'm Austin Gohn, the lead pastor at Bellevue Christian Church. And we're a church where ordinary people are learning to live everyday life like Jesus. Obviously, that looks a little bit different right now, but we believe that in any conditions, Jesus can still make disciples and people can still hear the good news of what God has done for us. Um, if you're uh, joining us right now for the live stream, say hi in the chat next to the screen. Say hi to other people as you see them show up. Share a verse maybe that's been encouraging you this week. If you're new, maybe you're attending a church service for the first time. We're so glad that you're joining us uh, for this service. Let us know by going to bellevuechristian.church slash new. There's a little short form you can figure or, or fill out that will let us follow up with you. Um, if at any point during the service or any point this week you want prayer or need prayer or want people to pray for you or even want someone to pray with you, you can go to bellevuechristian.church slash prayer and there's a short form you can fill out and someone on our prayer team will follow up with you. Uh, today, my wife Julie Gohn is going to be leading us in worship. Um, that's going to be followed by the next sermon in our Church from Six Feet Apart series. We'll have an opportunity to take communion at home. I encourage you guys to get your uh, bread and juice together at this point. Um, and an opportunity to give online and some announcement that some announcements at the end, including a special announcement about uh, something that we're going to be doing in response to COVID-19. So stay with us until the very end today. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, it says that the early church was regularly praising God. And we believe that even from six feet apart, that that's something that we can do right now. So why don't you go ahead and stand and join us in worship. Well, thank you for joining us here at Bellevue Christian Church. We're glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. Um, we're excited to be together um, just to worship our God. So why don't you stand and join us in singing this morning? worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done and break every chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things faithful through every storm you'll be faithful forevermore you have done great things and i know you will do it again for your promise is yes and amen you will do great things god you do great Free of 
This next song that we're going to do is um, a little bit of a new spin on an old, wonderful hymn. And when I was preparing for this song, I was thinking through um, just the words and what it meant to me in this season of our life. Um, and I kept coming back to um, a story in the Gospels that we hear over and over in almost every Gospel um, of Jesus calming the storm. Um, and so I wanted to read uh, that story for you because the words just, um, yeah, just kept coming back to me. So let me read this for you. It's from Mark 4, uh, verses 35 through 41. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, Jesus, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. He said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. I know that a lot of us are going through many different storms. Um, collectively, as a, as a globe, we are going through a large storm. Um, individually, in your families, in your homes, there's storms <laughs> uprising in, um, in and around you. And I just want to encourage you that our God is still the God who can calm the wind and the waves, that our God is still the God who can say to you, peace, be still. Um, and so it's my prayer that he says that to you in this, this time as we continue worshiping, um, that he says, peace, be still to your heart and to your soul. Let's sing together.
words are familiar to you and speak peace to you, so let's sing those again. So about a month ago, when this crisis was just getting started, there was a story that came out in the New York Times with the title, this is what it was called. It said, he has, he has 17,700 bottles of hand sanitizer and nowhere to sell them. It was a story about two enterprising brothers who, the day after the first coronavirus death in, in the United States, went out and bought up all the hand sanitizer that they could find, totaling over 17,000 bottles. It started with a Dollar Tree, then a Walmart, then a Staples, then a Home Depot. And over the next three days, they bought, um, or they drove 1,300 miles all across the backwoods of Kentucky and Tennessee. Um, and they ended up with their initial 300 bottles. They were selling them online uh, for between $8 and $70 each, which is a lot more than they were purchasing them for, even as hospitals were rationing those same supplies. And then, out of nowhere, Amazon um, shut them down, along with a couple other websites where they were selling them. Um, and they shut them down for price gouging, which, in other words, is trying to make a profit um, and forcing the prices up really high. And they ended up being stuck with about 17,000 bottles of hand sanitizer um, in a storage locker. And in the end, after this story ran in the New York Times, they ended up deciding to donate it, I think, to save their reputations. Now, regardless of what you feel about the morality of that story, whether you think they were like, man, they were just enterprising, or whether they were you know, really wrong for that, what this did is this story opened up the conversation around hoarding during a moment of crisis, which is the tendency to stockpile more than you need just in case you might need it later. Um, and this story is extreme, obviously. But Jesus teaches that the same compulsive tendency is actually deep within each of our hearts. And it shows up in a variety of ways, depending on who you are. For some, it's hoarding stuff, where we find, we're afraid that we won't be able to find something again, so we get more than we need, whether it's at Aldi or Target, whether it's Oreos or toilet paper or hand sanitizer. Or we hoard time. Some of us have more time than ever right now, but we're afraid to let go of it for other people. Or some of us have less time than ever right now, and so we're really protective of any spare time that we have and holding on to it at all costs. Others of us hoard money. We're in uncertain economic times right now where you know, we don't know what next week will mean or next month will mean or a year from now will mean. And so we find ourselves holding on, holding on to more than just like the typical emergency supply fund. We're holding on to a lot more just in case we need it later. 
And so this story is extreme, obviously. I don't imagine any of you have 17,000 bottles of hand sanitizer um, in a storage unit somewhere. But at the same time, we all have that same tendency within us, that same tendency to result to the, or to, to fall back to the default habit of hoarding in a time of crisis. Right now, we're in a series called Church from Six Feet Apart, where we're exploring what life together looks like when you feel all alone. We're taking a look at one of the most formative texts in the Bible when it comes to shaping a vision of life together. Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. And we're thinking about some of the habits of life together listed out in that passage. A passage that assumed they were going to be gathering in person. We're asking, what does it look like to do those habits from six feet apart? What does it look like to devote ourselves into those habits rather than drifting into the default habits associated with a moment of crisis? What does it look like to have generosity in a time of hoarding, fellowship in a time of isolation, apostles' teaching in a time of streaming, and prayer in a time of control? And this week we're going to be exploring what does it look like to be generous in a time of hoarding, which I believe is what many of us long for. Not just believers, but unbelievers as well. We long to be generous. We long for, to be a part of generous communities. But we find ourselves struggling to practice that in our everyday lives. If you have a Bible, why don't you open up to Acts chapter 4, 32 through 37. We're going to take a quick look back at Acts chapter 2, but we're going to be mostly in Acts chapter 4, 32 through 37. And we're also going to be a little bit in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 as well. And so if you have your Bibles open um, to Acts chapter 4, I want to start now back with Acts chapter 2, one of the most formative texts on shaping this vision of life together. But one of the clearest habits of life together that shows up in this text is the habit of generosity. Listen back to Acts chapter 2, 42 through 47. In verse 44, it says this, All the believers were together and had everything in common. And then it says, listen to how far they went. It says, They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And in that verse, we're starting to get a picture of the radical generosity that was present in the life of the early church. But if you go ahead a few chapters to chapter 4, you get an even deeper picture of what that generosity looked like, a more expansive picture of it um, in Acts chapter 4, 32 through 37. And let's read this and listen for the radical generosity in this community. It says, All the believers were of one heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. Just imagine that for a second. Imagine a community where there are no needy persons among them. From, for from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. And then here's a case study of one person. Joseph, a Levite, which is just uh, the tribe he was from, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Perhaps this is why he got the name son of encouragement. Sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the apostles' feet. These two passages together, Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, offer us and form a vision of radical generosity in the early church. And I want to note just three things about that before we begin to consider why they were so generous. The first is that generosity was voluntary rather than involuntary. No one's being forced to share their possessions. No one's being pressured into sharing their possessions. No one's being uh, coerced into sharing their stuff or their money. But people are doing this out of their own volition because they want to. And that's a really important thing to say about this text because it's one of the things that differentiates what's going on with the early church and some of the political visions of redistribution that are often given. But here's how Paul says it. He says, Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. And the idea here is that you know, we want this vision of redistribution and wealth, but the way it's going to happen is going to, it's going to happen voluntarily within the life of the church. Now the second thing is this, is that generosity was both organic and organized. Organic and organized. On the one hand, there's a sense that people were just giving away possessions or money to anybody who had need. Um, maybe just directly as needs arose. Maybe they heard, hey, my neighbor um, who's also a believer has this need. I'm just going to give some money to help him out. On the other hand, there's also some centralized, organized nature to it as well, as people are bringing money that they've gotten from properties they've sold to the apostles' feet, and then the apostles are distributing it, perhaps through another team that we're going to see show up in Acts chapter 6, to people who have need. 
And so they're now distributing that wealth to the people who need it. And so it's both organized and organic, centralized and decentralized. So it's voluntary and out and voluntary, organic and organized, but also the generosity was both money-based and resource-based. It was both financial and um, non-financial resources. In this passage, there's a sense that people are not just sharing money, but they're sharing their stuff. You know, you have a guy who has a riding lawnmower and he sees his na- believing neighbor has a lawn that needs mowed and he says, hey, you can borrow my riding lawnmower. That kind of stuff is happening in the early church. At the same time, maybe this guy has two riding lawnmowers and he notices that his neighbor has a need that money could meet. And he says, hey, I'm going to sell one of my riding lawnmowers so that I can give you the money that you need. And so they're both sharing possessions and sometimes they're selling things that they possess in order that they might give money to those who have need. And I think that's important because it's not just one or the other. Generosity isn't just limited to money, but it extends to a whole way of life. Generosity is a, is a posture. It's not just about what happens with your bank account. It's about what happens with your schedule. It's about what happens with your possessions and within your own home. That's what generosity is all about, not just your money. And as a result of all of this, that this generosity that was in the life of the church that was voluntary, not voluntary, involuntary, organic and organized, money-based and resource-based, what does it say? It says in chapter 4, verse 34, there were no needy persons among them. There were no needy persons among them. That's a, a crazy result as a, as a result of this in the life of the church. Now, as I mentioned last week, this is the Instagram of the early church. It's, they, they get things wrong. If you read ahead to just chapter 5, you hear a pretty famous story about Ananias and Sapphira, who didn't just have a problem with generosity, but had a problem with lying and deceit. And what ended up happening is uh, they ended up being dying instantaneously, um, just shortly after this, and it's all related to generosity. But here, we're seeing what generosity looks like at its best. We're getting an image of generosity at its best. And even amid social distancing, this is a vision that we want to reach for and strive for, even from six feet apart. But the question is why? Why was generosity, rather than hoarding, their default response? What did the early church know about the world that we don't often realize? What did they know about generosity that we don't know? One of the things to realize about the author of Acts is that he's also the author of what's called the Gospel of Luke. The long title of Acts is Acts of the Apostles. But the writer of that is the the person who's named Luke, who also wrote the Gospel of Luke, which is about the life and ministry of Jesus. And originally, it was actually one long book. It was Luke-Acts, all together, where Luke was telling the story of the life and ministry of Jesus, and Acts was telling the story about the life and ministry of the apostles following the message of Jesus. Acts is part two. Luke is part one. Here's why that's significant. If you're wondering why they were so generous, you just have to go back to earlier in the story for an answer. You have to go look at the teaching of Jesus to make sense of why these people were so generous. You have to remember what he taught about life in the kingdom of God. If you remember, the main thing Jesus came to tell us about was the good news of the kingdom of God. Here's how we describe it at our church. We say that God, through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, has opened up everyday life in his unending kingdom for ordinary people like you and me. And what he did is he made that life in that kingdom available through his death on the cross in our place and through his triumph over death and resurrection. Now he's made it that life available and we enter into that life through baptism and faith and repentance. But as we enter into that kingdom, Jesus also has a lot of teaching about how we're supposed to live in that kingdom. And one of the things he taught about most was the economics of the kingdom of God. And there's a particularly famous teaching from Jesus that I imagine the apostles would have been teaching to these new believers. It's it's memorable. It's something that would have been on their minds that would have shaped the kind of life that we're seeing in Acts. You can almost assume it's being taught in the background. It's a little bit of a long passage, but let's read through Luke chapter 12, 22 through 34. Jesus has his apostles and he's teaching them. And here's what he says. He says, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, not a, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither sow nor reap. They have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, are being anxious, can add a single hour to this, his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. 
But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive in the field today, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith? And do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. For all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. And he goes on, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's a long passage. There's a lot going on here. But I read the whole because I think it's in the background of the minds of the believers. And I just want to focus on one idea that I think shapes why they're so generous. And it's this. And it's what we see show up here. It's that if a scarcity mindset leads to hoarding, an abundance mentality leads to generosity. If a scarcity mentality leads to hoarding, an abundance mentality leads to generosity. In other words, our behaviors, our actions follow our mindset, our mentality, or our worldview. If you read this passage closely, you're going to notice that Jesus is contrasting two different mindsets or mentalities that produce two different results. And I'm going to put these up on a chart for us. On the one hand, you have the scarcity mentality that shows up here. And the scarcity mentality says, hey, there's not enough for everyone. Um, and so I need to take as much as I can. And that leads to anxiety because then we, we're responsible for our own lives. And then that leads to hoarding, which again is storing up more and more for ourselves. On the other hand, you have what you might call the abundance mentality. And the abundance mentality says the opposite. It says there is enough for everyone. There's enough to go around, which leads to then trusting God with our lives, believing that he loves and cares for us, which then allows us to be generous rather than hoard. So if a scarcity mentality leads to hoarding, an abundance mentality leads to generosity. And that's what you see come out of this passage. And what we can assume is that the early church had an abundance mentality rather than a scarcity mentality. What we see Barnabas doing in this scene, selling property, giving his money at the apostles' feet, and letting them redistribute it, what we see is we're seeing somebody who has an abundance mentality that's leading to generosity rather than hoarding. And to illustrate the difference between the scarcity mentality and abundance mentality, I want to spend an, a ridiculous amount of time discussing toilet paper, uh, just for a little bit. I've taken this from our home. I saw some of your mouths water just as I, I got it out. Um, and I promise you that this is the most that I'm ever going to talk about toilet paper in a sermon. But right now it's normal that if you go to Target or Aldi or any grocery store, you look for the toilet paper shelves, often you'll find that they're completely wiped out and they're empty. Which means that what's happened is that this toilet paper has become a treasured commodity, right? This used to be something we didn't think much about, just an everyday part of our lives. Now it is a treasured commodity. Um, and right up there with some other treasured commodities that we look for. I look back on the days when high schoolers used to TP one another's houses and I just think you were so naive. You didn't know what you had. You had a treasured commodity in your hands and you were just wasting it on pranks. There's news alerts for when it comes in stock. There's limits for how much you can buy. And we're willing to pay a premium for toilet paper. We don't matter how many plies it has. We are willing to pay a premium at this point. And there's two responses to this. Um, what's happening with toilet paper is one is you see those who have an abundance mentality. And people with an abundance mentality are generous with toilet paper, right? They're sharing toilet paper. They're, say, they're calling their friends up and they're saying, hey, there's toilet paper at Target. Go get some while you can. I'll pick some up for you. I have friends like my neighbor Eric or our friend Amelia who has dropped off toilet paper at our house right now, even at risk to themselves, you know, at risk of running out themselves. They've been generous with toilet paper to us. So there are those with an abundance mentality. But there's also those with a scarcity mentality. Those who say, look, I don't know if this is going to be here next time. I know I got 40 rolls at home, but I might as well pick up another, uh, another pack of, uh, 20 pack of Charmin while I found it, because I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find this again, and I don't want to get the discount brand next time. And so we find ourselves stocking up more and more of it just in case. But in reality, what we're seeing happen in the toilet paper aisle of a Target is a picture or a microcosm or a window of what happens with the world at large and with everything else under normal conditions. The world is just, it's just one big target toilet paper aisle where there, we're constantly grabbing things and there's a tendency toward generosity or hoarding when it comes to resources. So think about stuff and time and money for a second. If we see those things with an abundance mentality, we'll be generous with them. We'll give away our time. We'll give away money. We'll give away stuff. 
But if we see those things with a scarcity mentality, we'll always take as much as we possibly can just in case it's not there next time. And so in the end, we get a picture of how humans approach all the resources in the world if we simply take a walk down the toilet paper aisle at a Target. But it gets actually a little deeper than this. Like I said, this is the deepest dive we're ever going to do on toilet paper in a sermon. But I think if we follow this illustration a little bit further, it gets more interesting. A few weeks ago, I'm going to get rid of this at this point, otherwise I'm going to keep messing with it. Um, a few weeks ago, I read an article on Medium by Will Oremus called What Everyone's Getting Wrong About the Toilet Paper Shortage. And he says that the problem isn't so much with hoarding, or not hoarding alone, but with supply chains. So you ready for a deep dive on toilet paper supply chains? Get ready. I don't care if you're ready. We're going for it anyways. So what he says is there's two kinds of toilet paper supply chains. There's commercial supply chains and residential supply chains. Commercial supply chains produce those huge rolls of toilet paper that you have in schools or workplaces or hotels or restaurants, where up until the lockdown, we spent a lot of time. Um, And then residential supply chains produce toilet paper for our homes. And those supply chains use different factories, different mills, different trucking companies, entirely different pathways to get their toilet paper from uh, from the factory to uh, the market. And so what would happen is when we went on lockdown, we started spending all of our time at home. And so all of the toilet paper that was going to workplaces and restaurants is still going to those places and is still pointed in that direction, but we need more of it at home. Listen to this. This is what Georgia Pacific said. Georgia Pacific, a leading toilet paper manufacturer based in Atlanta, estimates that the average household will use 40% more toilet paper than usual if all of its members are staying home around the clock. That's a huge leap in demand for a product whose supply chain is predicated on the assumption that demand is essentially constant. And so yes, he says, there's hoarding going on. Of course people are taking more than they need. But there's also a problem with what he calls the supply chain. It's getting toilet paper from the manufacturer to the people who need it. And it's not that easy to flip all of the, the commercial supply chains to residential supply chains. Now, if you just had your mind blown, like I did when I first read this article, there's more to it. And this is why I think this is significant for what we're talking about right now. I didn't just want to give you a tidbit about toilet paper supply chains. What this does is it forces us to ask the question, how does God get the abundance that he's created, the abundance of resources that he's created in the world, how does God get those abundance to, that abundance to the people who need it most? And so what he does is he makes use of a supply chain a supply chain that involves ordinary people like you and me. And then we see this language show up in 2 Corinthians. In 2 Corinthians 8 and 9, Paul is in a situation where he's trying to raise money from the churches in Corinth to help with a famine relief effort that's happening with the churches in Jerusalem that had wiped out their economy. And so he's raising money from Corinth, but then listen to the supply chain language that he uses. If if I'm losing you, just stay with me. Follow me here. He says this, Our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be a quality. Now listen, at the present time, your plenty will what? Your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. The goal is equality. As it is written, the one who gathered much did not have too much, and the one who gathered little did not have too little. 2 Corinthians 8, 13 through 15. In short, he's saying that people with more and more than enough are actually part of God's supply chain, and we're meant to take that plenty that we have and use it to supply and meet the needs of other people. And so God normally doesn't just drop resources out of the sky, although he did that in the Old Testament a few times. Normally what God does, is he uses humans and he gives things to us, he entrusts things to us to steward and then to point that supply that he has given us in the direction of those who need it most. He uses people to get the job done. Then Paul goes on to say this, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. And he goes on, You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will will result in thanksgiving to God. What he's saying is that God is able to give back what you give away because he has an endless supply. This isn't prosperity gospel. This is simply uh, supply chain theology. This is simply the fact that God uses ordinary people. He has unlimited resources to get his abundance into the hands of the people who need it most. Here's why that matters. If there's a shortage of something, if there's a shortage of something, There's a problem with the human supply chain, not God the supplier. If there's a shortage of something, 
There's a problem with the human supply chain, not God the supplier. Sometimes we think, I have a scarcity mindset because there's just not enough to go around. But the reality is that God has endless resources. But what happens is that those resources get stuck with people who ought to be giving those resources to other people who really need them. If you have more than enough, that means God has given you things that we're supposed to then give away to others. If you have more than enough time, give some away. If you have more than enough stuff, give some away. If you have more than enough money, give some away. You are part of God's supply chain and getting his resources to the people who need them. I promise you that is the most involved toilet paper illustration I'm ever going to do. But if we believe what Jesus is saying, we can have an abundance mentality that leads to generosity. And if we listen to what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians, we realize that we're actually a significant part of God's supply chain. So the question for us is, what, does gener- what is generosity with our stuff, time, and money look like right now? So in this season, we're thinking about what does it look like you know, to be generous in a pandemic-stricken world? And it can be overwhelming to know where to start. I know I've talked to a lot of people who are like, Austin, I just don't even know what to do. There's so many needs out there. I felt that way as a pastor right off the bat. I was like, there's so many needs. Where do we even start as a church? And so I want you to think about, to help you kind of get some clarity around generosity, I want you to think about it in three different circles of generosity. Circle one is the local church. This is what we see happening in Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4 when the church was selling their possessions and giving to all who had need. And it's generosity that's pointed specifically in the direction of other believers locally. And in our church, we see that happening on two levels. Again, we see kind of the organic way and the organized way, the decentralized way and the centralized way. Now, the organic way is, you know, for example, um, I've heard of this happening in a lot of discipleship communities, but even beyond those as well, of somebody having a need and then somebody else in that discipleship community meeting that need. And the rest of the church never even finds out about it. You know, um, Julie and I, we never even shared a need of just getting a face mask right now, but um, Renee in our, in our discipleship community had made some, and she asked everybody in our community if we needed any right now. And so we got some from her. She supplied our need out of her plenty. Um, but then there's also the centralized way that it happens. And this is what our care team does, right? We've been talking about how you can email our care team at care at bellevuechristian.church. And what they do is they take funds that we've given as a church and we've allocated out of our budget each year to meet the needs of people in our church, especially right now, people who have lost work due to COVID-19. Our, our team has been putting together ways and doing what they can to help people who are in need right now. So the first circle is the local church. The second circle is the local community, the community around our church. So we have a responsibility not just to other believers, but we have a responsibility to unbelievers in our community as well. Um, Jeremiah 29, 7 is one of my favorite verses, and here's what Jeremiah writes. He says, Seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. He says that we have a responsibility for the cities where God has placed us, for the neighborhoods that we dwell in. And there's a lot of ways that this looks right now. It might look like donating blood to help with the blood shortage. It might look like volunteering with one of the local groups providing food, like the fantastic team from the Bellevue Farmers Market. You know, round of applause to them. They've been doing an amazing job right from the beginning finding ways to supply food for people who are high risk. And you can donate money to that or to volunteer your time. It might look like reaching out to your neighbors using one of our Hello Neighbor cards. It might look like praying for our local businesses or checking in or spending a little bit more money locally right now to help see them through this crisis. And then circle three, so first is circle one is our local church, circle two is our local community, circle three is our local and global partners. So you could just call it, say, the global church, but specifically our local and global partners. So we need to think beyond just the local church, beyond just our local community, to what God is doing through the partners that we have around the world. This is what's actually kind of happening in 2 Corinthians 8 through 9, where Paul is raising money from Corinth, one church, for another church in Jerusalem to help them through a time of crisis. So as a church, you may or may not know this, but we actually set aside forty dollars to $45,000 a year to support gospel partners that we have throughout the world, locally and globally, churches, nonprofits, and missionaries. Um, we help uh, anybody who has to support raise their job or organizations that rec- rec- um, rely on support like nonprofits or even church plants. We um, set aside a part of our budget to support them. 
Um, and so two weeks ago, actually, we made the decision to simplify our church budget for the foreseeable future as we're navigating this crisis. But one thing we didn't simplify was our support for our partners, because we know they need it now more than ever. And just this past week, I was on the phone with one of our partners, and they said to me, I just want, I just want you to know, Austin, that your church, when, when this past week, we got a check in the mail for this quarter from your church. We not, we, they weren't surprised, but they were so blessed by the fact that we still care about them and we're still giving to them and we're still helping them through this time. Or maybe you've noticed, if you follow me on Instagram, you've noticed how I've been sharing about Urban Impact Foundation, a fantastic organization right here in the city of Pittsburgh who's doing incredible work in the neighborhoods right around us. Um, and we have two urban missionaries that we actually support who came um, up through our church. And uh, that's just another organization that we work with um, right now. And this season's hard for nonprofit organizations, as many of them are, are struggling with uncertainty, as people are withdrawing some of their support during just hard economic times. But I encourage you that if you have the means, and if you aren't, or if you are already, keep supporting. And if you aren't, maybe look for one of our partners that you could step up and support right now. And so those are the three main circles of generosity, the local church, the local community, and our local and global partners. But it can still be a little bit overwhelming to know where to start. It's still a lot, you know, to figure out what do I do, who, do, who can I trust, and so on. And so what we've decided as a church to do is to keep it really simple. And before I tell you kind of what we're going to be doing, I want to start with a story about our church's bell tower. For about three years, there is a, a dusty shoe mark on the ceiling of our church foyer. But only a few of us knew the reason why. Me and my brother Mark and our friend Andrew Howler had decided that we wanted to explore the church bell tower at Bellevue Christian Church. We'd always wondered what was up there um, and why we never heard the church bell ring. We didn't exactly get permission to do this, but we decided we'd just keep it on the down low and we'd go explore it. And so we get together at the church on a summer afternoon. I think it was in high school. It might have been college, but um, one afternoon, middle of the summer, and we meet in the church foyer to figure out how to get up there. We see there's a loose tile that maybe you've seen at our church, and we look around, and so we find that tile, and we push it up, and we, climb, we get, uh, we get um, a ladder to climb through it. And so we climb up the ladder, and we get into a very dark chamber that's about 15 to 20 feet high, and it has a rickety wooden ladder leaning against one of the walls, um, and another, what looks like another removable you know, tile or covering um, about 15 to 20 feet above us, and it's dark in there. And like teenage boys, we did not bring flashlights, um, and we weren't really thinking through all the parts of our plan. Um, all we had was dumb phones and the tiny amount of light that emits from those. Um, and so one of us decides to climb the ladder first. I don't remember who it was. Somebody decides to climb the ladder, and the other two stand in the chamber below, shining tiny bits of light from our dumb, dumb phones that are doing nothing. Um, and we find that we get to the top of the ladder, and we can't, nobody, we can't figure out how to remove the ceiling tile up there. And so after about 10 minutes of attempts, we finally find a way to get the cover off and light bursts into the dark chamber below where we've been standing. Um, and the person who climbs the ladder disappears into the room above, and we hear them yell down, there's no bell up here. Um, and so we climb the, up the ladder to the bell chamber. We find out that he's not joking. And in fact, all we find up there is a singular metal chair. It's all very dusty. Um, and there's a few loudspeakers that are pointed out the windows. And so we're, we're a bit disappointed by the fact that there's no bell, and we're a little bit creeped out by the metal chair, honestly. And so we sit up there and chat for a little while before heading back down. We consider what it would be like to um, spend the night up there sometime. But on our way back down, one of us slips as we're climbing through the last you know, part back into the foyer, and their shoe hits the ceiling, um, leaving a dusty shoe mark, which is evidence that we had been up there. And so even though I ended up you know, telling some people that we had climbed up the bell tower, I started asking around to find out why we didn't have a bell. And I kept hearing some version of the same story um, from different people. And it was that we donated it to be melted down during one of the world wars for a scrap drive that they used to do at the time to help with the war effort. And so actually this past week, I called some people in our church to try to confirm this story. But nobody could tell me for certain. It's a rumor. It's a legend, uh, a theory. Um, but it's a legend that we choose to believe. It's a story of legendary generosity, a story of a generation in our church's history making generous sacrifices for the sake of others in the face of crisis. But here's what I want. I don't want to just tell legends about what God did through our church 
a, almost a century ago. I want future generations to tell legends about what God did through our church in this time, right now. And so that's why what we're going to be doing starting today and continuing through the next two Sundays is launching something called the Donate the Bell campaign, which is a campaign to raise $15,000 for a COVID-19 relief fund that we're going to manage through our church. And it's going to be our opportunity to show legendary generosity in the face of crisis. This relief fund is going to be used to fund those three circles of generosity. It's going to be used to fund um, people in our, our, you know, our care team is going to manage some of that to help distribute it to people in our church who have needs during this crisis and need a financial assistance. Um, we're going to, we have another team called the Gospel Initiative Team led by Nathan Anderson, who's going to be helping us come up with projects in our local community, um, specifically Bellevue and Avalon. And we're, we're working on a few projects that involve blessing local businesses and blessing local families as well. And the third thing is that if needed, we're going to be able to use some of that fund to bless our local and global partners right now as they have a variety of needs that they're trying to navigate as well. And so I want each of you to be asking, I don't want you guys to donate bells. This isn't about donating bells. We don't even have a bell to donate right now. But what I want you to ask is for, for you, what does it look like for you to donate the bell right now? What does it look like for you and your family to contribute legendary generosity at a time like this? And uh, I understand if you're not in a position to do, right now, do that right now, and that's okay. But if you are, be asking, what does it look like to donate the bell? Get your kids involved. Let them do chores around the house to raise money so that you can give away to the Donate the Bell campaign. And so when you decide how much to give, there's two ways that you can give. Um, you can go online to bellevuechristian.church slash bell, and then there's a button there to give to the COVID-19 relief um, fund or on the giving page of our website if you just click COVID-19 relief fund or donate the bell campaign from the drop down menu that'll be able to give to it as well um, or you can write a check to Bellevue Christian Church just send it to 680 Lincoln Avenue um, Bellevue PA 15202 and you can just write donate the bell campaign or COVID-19 relief fund in the memo line what we're asking is that this is over and above giving. So again, think about what you normally give to our church in a month and keep giving that because we need that right now, especially as a church. But we ask that this is over and above, going to the next level um, to try to give to this fund as a church. Um, and so my hope is that we wildly exceed the goal of $15,000 and that a decade from now, people are telling stories of this generation. And by generation, I don't just mean one specific subset of our church. I mean our whole, the whole generation of our church. I want future generations to tell stories of legendary generosity in the face of unprecedented need from this generation in Bellevue Christian Church. As a result of this campaign and the initiatives we launch from it, I hope that we get what we talked about last week. We get favor among the people in our local community. And I hope that we also see Acts chapter 4 come true, where it says, And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no needy persons among them. To come to a close, there's one word that I haven't talked about yet. And it's the secret to all of this. It's the word grace. Notice how the word grace shows up in Acts 4 and in 2 Corinthians 8 through 9. In Acts chapter 4, it says, In God's what? God's grace was so powerfully. In other, you can just put the word gift. And God's gift is so powerfully at work in them all, or even generosity. And, now, and then it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 through 2, it says, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the generosity or the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Both of these passages are, are reminding us of something very significant, the most significant thing about generosity, and it's that we can be generous with others because God has been generous with us. We can be generous with others because God has been generous with us. Listen to how Paul puts it so eloquently. He says this, For you know that the grace, the generosity, the gift of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through you, his pov so that you through his poverty might become rich. That's 2 Corinthians 8 verse 9. We have received the ultimate generosity. God has not just, you know, it's not just about financial generosity or resources or anything, but God has given us spiritual generosity. He's exchanged his own son for us, that Jesus went to death on a cross in our place so that we might be exchanged our spiritual poverty for his spiritual riches. Generosity starts with the gospel. The gospel, the good news of what God has done for us in Jesus, ought to make the church the most generous society on earth. And it's at the table of communion that I'm inviting you to do at home where we remember that. It's at this table where we break bread 
And we drink juice representing Christ's body broken for us and his blood poured out for us. It's at this table where we remember the ultimate act of generosity, the ultimate act of God giving of himself for us. And it's as we partake in this meal that we find the grace that we need to give and be generous toward others. And I encourage you to take a few minutes to take communion at home and to give online. And maybe to begin to pray together about how you guys might give to the Donate, Donate the Bell campaign in the coming weeks. Stay with us for announcements. Hey, we just want to thank you for joining us at Bellevue Christian Church this week. We're a church where ordinary people are learning to live everyday life like Jesus, all because of what Jesus has done for us in the gospel. Again, if you're new, maybe you joined us for the first time this week. We're so glad that you were here. Let us know by going to bellevuechristian.church slash new. Um, that's the best way uh, uh, to let us know that you were here. And if you haven't already, also sign up for our email. That's the best way to get updates about what's going on in our church. You can just go to the front page, bellevuechristian.church, and there's an opportunity to sign up for our email there. Um, if you need uh, prayer, go to bellevuechristian.church slash prayer, and somebody will follow up with you. Or if you need care right now, whether spiritual or financial or otherwise, reach out to our care team um, or by sending an email to care at bellevuechristian.church, and someone will follow up with you. As I mentioned in the sermon, this week we're launching the Donate the Bell campaign, which will go through Sunday, May 10th. So the next two Sundays, we'll be able to give an update next week on how it's going. And our goal is to raise at least $15,000. And I believe we're going to exceed that, but that's just our starting point, um, which we're going to use to fund a variety of, niche, of initiatives related to COVID-19. And here's a short little video about that. When I was in high school, I climbed into the bell tower at Bellevue Christian Church to see what was up there. And I found something surprising. There's no bell. And so I started asking around to try to get the story on why there was no bell, and I kept hearing the same thing, that the bell was melted down during one of the world wars to be donated to the war effort. And it was a story of legendary generosity in a time of unprecedented need. And right now, as COVID-19 continues to spread, I believe that we have the same opportunity in our generation. That's why this week we're launching the Donate the Bell campaign, which is all about raising $15,000 to help with COVID-19 relief funds and relief efforts that we're going to be doing through our church. We don't actually want to donate a bell. We don't have a bell to donate, but we want you to ask yourself, what does it look like for me and my family to donate the bell right now? My hope is that generations from now, people are telling stories about legendary generosity in response to unprecedented need in our own time. To find out more or to give online, go to bellevuechristian.church slash bell. So again, we're launching the Donate the Bell campaign this week, and you can give online this week by visiting bellevuechristian.church slash bell, um, or you can send a check to 680 Lincoln Avenue, Bellevue PA 15202, and put Donate the Bell or COVID-19 Relief Fund um, in the memo line. And again, we're asking that this is over and above kind of your regular giving to our church. And then if you're on social media, I encourage you to share about this campaign by sharing the 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 one-by-one one graphic um, on bellevuechristian.church slash bell or the video that's on the same page to encourage other people to be a part of it as well. Stay with us over the next few weeks because we're going to be introducing some more things that we're going to be doing during this season as a church. And we're going to be announcing some new ways for you to connect with other people and some virtual courses that we're going to be offering. Let me close now with the Great Commission. 
Jesus says this, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and I'll be with you always, even to the very end of the age. 